Hey everyone, it's uh, part two of the Exodus under a microscope. So before I move forward unto Shechem, I want to bring something up, maybe a couple things. And don't get upset with me when I start nitpicking like this, because remember, it is Exodus under a microscope. <laughs> um... A lot of these things are going to seem very myopic, and I just hit my microphone because I was talking with my hands. Um, one thing I want to be clear about is yesterday I spent some time, of course, in Romsis. And I said that it just didn't seem to me that Romsis, because you could look at it as a compound in a couple few different ways. You really can. And thus far, we, we don't know what way to look at it. <clears throat> but I do want to be clear about something. This is really helpful, too, as you study, is that names, um, I kind of most specifically, proper names of places, can often be retroactive. You'll see that in places like Haberun, uh, called Hebron. It was for, if you look at Genesis 23, before Haberun, it was called, uh, Kirith Arbo. It wasn't called Haberun until much later on when Yisrael had taken it. Up till then, it was Kirith Arbo. Um, it is possible that certain names of places and maybe peoples are retroactive and you always want to be cautious about that it's same thing with Bethal okay during the time of Abram Yitzhak and Jacob uh, Bethal was not called Bethal it was actually called Luz it's retroactive it wasn't called Bethal till later on it was called Luz so it is entirely possible that Romsis is really just retroactive. And it does make sense that these things, these names, would be presented in a retroactive way. Um, so if any author is writing in either, you know, a, a present tense way or um looking to a, a a future tense um they might just want to use the name of a place that the the reader you know would be aware of after that however there's some things that are kind of weird and I guess anybody can come to any conclusion that they want to about it, because I don't know exactly the right conclusion about it yet. The first five books uh, of the Bible, called Torah, but they're actually Thoreh, um, so they're attributed to Masha, or Moses, and if he's writing about what transpired with Abram, Yitzhak, Jacob, the patriarchs. And he calls a place Bethel, but we know it was Luz uh, up until a certain point. Actually, Jacob named a spot just near Luz Bethel, the house of Al. And then Luz later became just known as Bethel. Habarun. The thing that's interesting to me is that in Yusho or Joshua, you see that it said that Habarun proper was built around the same time as another city that would seem to be in Mitzrim. Um, all of these quotes I can't go to, I'd be going to so many, but you can find it. It's pretty easy if you just punch in a concordance search for 
uh, Habrun or Hebron. You'll find this quote. It's in Joshua. That it was built around the same time as another city in uh, what seems it seems like it was a city in Mitzrim. Um, but it, of course, is called Habrun uh, a few times in Genesis uh, or Bereshit. So, that retroactive name is interesting because I guess you would have to say there's only one of a few possibilities. Either it may have been known as both during the time of the patriarchs, both Habrun or Kiriath Arbo, and maybe it was uh, more commonly called Kirith Arbo during the time of um, the Bani Hath occupation or the Hathi, called, uh, they're usually called the Hittites. Um, or maybe during the time of um, Onik. I, I would have to say it was either known as both for a while, or there were two areas, and one just eventually encompassed the other. Um, or the text was edited to say this stuff. Um, I don't know why that would be. Um, <clears throat> I, there's just a lot of speculation, I suppose. But if we're talking about five books that were dictated to Masha by Yahweh, there would be no need to go back and do any editing whatsoever. Now, if Kirith Arbo was not known as Habrun during the time of the patriarchs, then it would have just been the forethought and foreknowledge of Alayim as he dictated it to Masha. I know that seems a little bit um, complicated. Again, nobody can fault me for complicated when we go through this subject. It is complicated. There's no way around it. So that it is possible that um, that Romsus was actually is being referred to retroactively when it says as far back as um, well, just about a couple centuries prior uh, that it is the land of Romsis as well as the land of Gashan. And perhaps Romsis as a city or place um, didn't get its name. The one clue that we would have that that name existed before the uh, what's usually called maybe storage cities uh, that were built by Yisrael, which were Romsus and Pathan. The clue that we have that it, it may have actually been Romsus before, <clears throat> which would probably have given it a more positive connotation than if it was Romsus later is the fact that um, when it's referred to earlier in Genesis, uh, in the same chapter as it's also called the Eretz Gashan, or Land of Gashan, is that it's called the Land of Romsus, not the Oir, or City of Romsus. So I have to put that out there because... Uh, you know, I, I'm assuming I'm not the only one thinking about these things as we go, obviously. Uh, anyone taking the time to listen or listen and watch, they're going to be thinking about these things also. So I want to try to equip you with all the information that I'm aware of and at the same time give you all of the possible variables too. I don't want to skew anything in any direction, you know, that I'm thinking. And, uh, of course, I'm doing my best to not really have any kind of preconceived notion to direction of where I want this to go. This is why I am not superimposing these places over a known map or a known geography. I am, however, comparing it to the Middle East, Palestine, Egypt, surrounding areas because... 
I absolutely see no way of this working over there. And as I've said before, even if the land was green at one time, which is just no proof that that was ever the case. When I say the land, I mean basically the, uh, it would have to be the Sinai Peninsula, the south area of, uh, of Palestine. So from the, uh, the, the northern tip of the Gulf, Aqaba, uh, going in sort of an outward cone shape, uh, the, uh, Easterly side going up to the Dead Sea, the westerly side going sort of in an angular way up to what we call the, the Gaza Strip. So now if that area from the Gulf of Aqaba up were, uh, were even green at one time, I still don't think you could get the sort of numbers in that small an area. If you pay attention to some of the sizes of the armies in battles between the Pelshathim and the uh, Yishrali, they're huge, just huge. I, not to mention some just majorly huge armies um, that fight battles in this land that we're speaking of, Canaan or the land of the Amory, even after this. The scale won't fit, even if somebody can try to argue that it may have been green at one time. And I just don't know that there's any proof of that. Um, I guess I would honestly think if this theory of desertification uh, had anything to it whatsoever, that you should be able to uh, show some kinds of signs of previous... Uh, lush, uh, or or just different uh, flora than than what is currently there. There would have to be something other than just a posited theory. And I've read a little bit on desertification, um, and thus far to me it seems extremely theoretical. Not that sand can't move; sand moves. And I guess if you have a a a continuancy of, of sandstorms, you know, in any given direction, you know, that could be a thing. Um, I did notice something, too. Actually, I had brought up um, in last the last video about how there, oh, there, okay, there's a location where you have to go to when plotting out Judah or Judah's border. And in, from this location, you will follow a Nahal, or river. It's called the Shihur. And it's as it goes out to the Yam, or sea. And actually, uh, at least one Oir, or city, of the Palsha theme is very near this. And it would be Oza, which is translated Gaza. <laughs> still, I still don't get the G thing. Now, trust me, I've heard, I've heard the rabbis and the people who follow the rabbi and the Masoretic thought. I've, I've heard them give excuses for this, but it's, I, it's still ridiculous to me. But what do I know? Anyways, that place where it starts out at, I said it's called Otsmun. And I said the most common root for oats is actually tree. Now, if you take the, the UN, I told you is a common suffix, and even if you look this up in, in Masoretic Hebrew, they'll tell you that UN is used as a diminutive suffix because there's really no way they could get around that. It's used so often. You know, it's it's the it's the less used suffixes that they can toy with, not something that's such a common suffix like un. So if you figure it as a suffix un, and you only have o, t, and m mm, or m otsum, you'll find that that is commonly uh, translated as uh, strength or stability. <coughs> Now, this does go back to what I had said last time about abstract words and how they kind of drive me nuts. Um, 
abstract words you can play with far too much. And I think that's one of the reasons why. I don't think that Obri was a heavily abstract language whatsoever. I think it is the toying with it uh, in the sense of the Masoretic Nakud and then later on the English translations. Um, of course, championed <coughs> or, or the, uh, the apogee uh, of English translations being King James and Boy, there's a lot. There's a lot that could probably be said about that. Considering things like codes and how uh, the rabbis use coding and they use gematria. Gematria is not something inherent in original obri. Okay, original obri doesn't have these number designations. If you if you want a number, you get it spelled out in a word. That's a later thing just like the nakud writing a language over a language which i believe is encoded and if we can crack that code or if somebody could crack that code it would actually get us a, a long way down the road um and to be honest with you i think what happened is that same coding was used because the king james version of the bible as it, it as it's told was the first Old Testament translated into English wherein the Hebrew was used instead of the Greek. And there is a great article out there, if you can find it, uh, that somebody had written about Francis Bacon and his Rosicrucians, who many people believe are behind what's called Shakespeare. And they did this to actually reform the English language. The English language was a lot different before this time. Um, that Bacon and his Rosicrucian Baconians had quite a lot to do with the final edits of the Bible and making the language appear as it does. And after spending a long time in King James and really scratching my head over why the wording is used, how it's used... <laughs> I, f I find it entirely believable. But again, if that's the case, then they were coding. And you know, Bacon was known. <laughs> he was known as an encryptor, a coder. Th that's not a secret, it's, or nor is it a speculation. The rabbis were known as encryptors, encoders. Secrecy is their MO. There's codes there, I think, to be found and broke. But I'm worried about the language, the original Obri language. So one thing I didn't uh, get to last time, and I can spend <clears throat> a quick minute on it because it's important, was the little bit of time I had spent looking at Gashan and the possibilities for what Gashan uh, means. Because remember, most of these places are going to be... Um, like place names based on characteristics of the place. And one other thing with the Otsamun and the tree thing, Oats, one other thing, I'm sorry. There is a port on a sea that um, Shalmay actually builds a navy on, a merchant navy. <clears throat> and um, sailors from uh, Thurishish actually sail this merchant navy and they. Uh, among other places, they frequently go to a place called Alpir. Um, so the port, the port is called in English, you'll see the words Ezion Geber. Geber. All right? And I think they actually still have a place that they've put on the uh, upper tip of the Gulf of Aqaba that they call um, it's Ezion. I think they start with an E. Ezion Gabur. I actually have it in here because this this is actually they make one of their stops at least really near here, and I'll find it right here. So the English. Uh, rendering of this is, is far different than what it ought to be. Here it is. Ezion Geber. E-Z-I-O-N. G-E-B-E-R. 
That's what they call it. Easy on Geber. But actually, in Obri, it's Otsiyun Geber. Now, if you look up something like Geberim, you'll see that it's uh, someone mighty or strong. Oats is used for tree more than anything. But please do. Go in and do your own word study on oats and see how many uh, instances you can find of it and all of its, um, its concrete uses like tree and trees or plank, wood, lumber. Uh, and then all of the abstract uses of it. Keep that suffix in mind too, un. So again, we've got two places that are supposed to be in the Negev to South Negev Desert. And I'm speaking of modern day Palestine, okay? They say these places are in the Negev to the South Negev, which is a very punishing desert. And both of these places we're talking about, both Otsmun and Otsian Gibur, both seem to have a very strong connotation towards trees, lumber, so on. So, okay, Gashan. Okay, so to go over Gashan, it's important to at least take a stab at this. This one was really difficult. <laughs> There's not a lot of... Uh, gush the g and the sh to to go on as a root at all um there's a number of words that start with with gush i mean there's gashur gashuri some of these are just names of peoples and you're not going to get anything else out of them unless you have more descriptions and you can determine that that was a title given to the people as opposed to a name when they were born which is going to be kind of a different circumstance now, the the only words that are going to give us an idea of what the land of Gashan might be is we can see that the words Geshem, so that's starting at 1652, and there is a number of Geshems entered, uh, 1652, 1653, 1654, and 1656, and in all instances, it's going to uh, be translated as rain, sometimes hard rain. If there are enough instances uh, or occurrences that any given word is used, um, usually the more the better if it's always working out within the context. So we can be relatively sure that Geshem is actually rain, type of rain. Now, we can't go with uh, Gashpa, because that's just a name of a person again. And Gashash, 1659, is supposed to be a verb and meaning to grope or feel with the hands, but it only has one occurrence, 1659. And I'm actually, I'll show you it real quick because I'm very close to it being on Gashan, Gashash. Yeah, so they're listing it as a verb, and they say to feel with the hand, grope, stroke, or feel. Now, in context with the verse, Isaiah 59.10, it says, We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. Now, I'm going to posit to you after we look at a couple more words with this gush root in it, that what we should be looking at is something that at least has a connotation of standing. So one word we want to take a quick look at is found in the ends. I got to get past here real quick. It's found in the ends. Um, it can't be the unedited. I got to change that. This is the unedited. I'm sorry, 5065. I'm going to put that in real quick. 5065. So we can take a fast look at that. 
because sometimes with these what we have to do is just go off preponderance of evidence and what little we may know about the individual characters like the sh, the ga, you know, the n because that's gashan, ga sh n. And I know at least a bit about all of these. So this nagash 5065 it's going to be listed as a verb. And it's oftentimes going to be listed as um, to press, drive, or oppress when it is a verb. To press, drive, or oppress. But the thing is, when you see it in context, it's kind of almost always taskmasters. You'll see it in Exodus a lot in the first few chapters of Exodus. <clears throat> and Perot commanded the same day. Uh, that the taskmasters of the people and their officers sang, and then Exodus 5.10, and the taskmasters of the people went out. Uh, again, 5.13, the taskmasters. When you get to Deuteronomy 15.2, and this is the manner of the release. <clears throat> Every creditor that lends ought unto his neighbor shall release it, if he shall not exact it of his neighbor or his brother. So, in a verb, it's used as taskmasters or exact. Of a foreigner, you may exact it again. Again, when you use exact instead of taskmasters, um, it becomes abstract. And then it's used as distressed. It's used as oppressor. Nagash. Now, is the nag the part of that word that we should be looking at? Because the... N is used as a very, very, very frequent prefix and suffix to shorter um, roots. But if we look at the next entry of Nagash, it is also listed as a verb. And we can see the short definitions to draw near or approach. It also has an IA of sexual intercourse, which is really strange. And the reason I say it's strange is because um, the word which I didn't even really want to go into because I'm just so unsure about why. I've looked at the roots. It's pilgash. Pilgash is often um, it's often translated as concubine. Now I'm gonna have to go into this, and it's not. <clears throat> It's not due to any perversion uh, per se, okay? It, it just, here's, here's what it is. So if you're in, um, I believe it's Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 has a lot of specifics concerning sexual behavior. And the ones in which we'll oftentimes see it translated as beast. And there is a verse that says, um, it doesn't say if a woman, uh, if a shah, um, it doesn't say if a woman lies with a beast <clears throat> like a man. It says if she stands before one. Um, and I'm getting this same idea from words like pilgash used for concubine um i i don't want to go too detailed into drawing that picture per se um as far as just a mode <coughs> excuse me a mode or posture of sexual intercourse um because i really put that out of my mind the first few times i saw that used in that way but what I'm getting at is, over and over and over again, I keep seeing this gash, G and sh, used for stand. Standing, upright. Okay, with gasham. You have the M at the end. Usually always denoting water or chaotic, and gasham is always used for rain. Many entries. Uh, so we see a, a lot of entries here with, now this is nagash. Uh, like Jacob uh, went near and rolled the stone uh, until he came near. 
handmaidens came near, the children came near, and they came near. Yuda came near. Um, so they they almost are always going to use it like for came near or brought them near. Um, but what they're doing as a verb is they are standing. They may be walking, but they are standing. And there's a number of other verbs that can be used uh, for walking, depending on what kind of walking we're doing. Are we talking about a journey? Well, there are different verbs for that. But are we talking about something that is just a slight movement of someone standing in one place and then slightly moving close to somebody? Then we have this, nagash. So, one more that is worth looking at is in the P's. And the reason I don't actually have these up and ready is because there's so many of these gash words that I had to go through. A lot of them just repeat entries, um, arbitrary repeat entries. So, in 6298, we can look at that real quick because that one's important too. 6298. It's pagash. And again, they're calling it a verb to meet, join, or encounter. And you'll see it uh, uh, when Oshu, my brother, met me. Um, uh, by all this drove which I met. Um, in that Yahweh met him. Like face to face, when you look at all the, uh, the occurrences of the P being used for facial features, the face, um, a face, not, not just the face of a, a man or beast, but uh, the face of a land, uh, used like as in edge as well. And then you put that with gash, pagash, uh, and of course, all of this being a standing thing to do, all of it being verb too. So I guess when you consider all of those things, and that groping at the wall that they use um, for that, uh, it was actually that geshesh, they say groping. I don't know how true that is. First off, it's a single occurrence. And... I know that Isaiah is definitely a book with a lot of verses in it that just, they sure don't seem right as far as their syntax, what words that are in there, and how it's translated. Isaiah is like that. Job is like that. Um, passages from Ezekiel and a bit from Jeremiah. Major prophets. You know, the ones that have uh, a lot of text in them that are extremely important to uh, eschatology, among other things. So now we're we're back to Gashan. G sh n. Now, almost without exception, when you see just an n at the end, you can figure that that n was built off <coughs> that earlier root. And if it's not a equivalent of the UN diminutive, like I went over yesterday with Shimashun, um then it's at least something very, very close. It would be characterized by, and that's what the N would be, in a way, a diminutive. Um, so, a standing, perhaps. Um, a place of standing. Standing, why standing? Shepherding and grazing. Now, I could be wrong. You could say, well, you have a preconceived notion. I mean, maybe, and you can accuse me of that if you want, and that's okay. But the thing is, I didn't necessarily have that in mind when I had to go through all of these roots of gosh to find uh, what the land of Goshen actually meant. So, I think that we are looking at a place that is a very big very big, wide open area, and 
it was probably used for grazing. As we see with what Peroas said, he had a lot of his beasts there too. Um, probably specifically prized horses and other animals that he kept in Gashan. That he wanted certain men that were very good at their trade to actually take care of his stables and herds in Gashan. So, I'm going to read a little bit here then. If I go back, I've got so many documents open uh, just because it's necessary, I'm afraid. And I'm going to read a little bit of when they're starting out um, from Mitzrim. And then we're going to have to take a look at Mitzrim and a few other things to see if we can't build our understanding of what these places were like and what they were um, or where they were in relationship to one another. So we can start with the <clears throat> simple account in Exodus 12.36. It says, And Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Mitzri, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Mitzri. And the, they didn't steal these things from them. The Mitzri gave these things to them. <laughs> Probably wanted them gone badly. Yeah, here, this is my grandma's necklace, but you know what? I want you to have it now. Uh, go, shoo. Anyways, it was not stealing. They gave them to them. Now, the idea of Lent, they use Lent, shall. We'd have to uh, definitely do a word study on shall. But 1237, and the children of Yisrael journeyed from, here we go, Romsis, to Sakuth about 600,000 and were only counting men and were probably not counting Louis or Levi. It's Louis because Louis never in the count. You can see that in numbers because what we're counting here and, and <clears throat> those uh, who were too young to fight were not counted. Those who were too old to stand, walk, and thus fight were not counted. <laughs> this is a very, very small amount of the population, but these were how counts were done. Um, this was counted very much like divisions militarily, okay? About 600,000 on foot that were men, besides children, um, and in 1238, a mixed multitude, and and Gam Oreb, um, which I think is pretty decent in the sense of a translation from Gam Oreb, or Gam Oreb Rab. So that would be a lot. Sometimes when you see like clouds of locusts or something, you're going to see Oreb, a big mass spread out. Gam Oreb Rab, <clears throat> excuse me. They went up with them. And it does say <coughs> that uh, Uboker, Makne, Kabod, Mad. And what that means is, first off, the, the Boker, cattle, um, and Boker, Makne. So mostly the Makne is really interesting because it is possessions, but it does seem to infer, infer, um, living possessions all animals i don't know okay but it does specify mostly cattle makne so they had a ton of cattle these people and they had a lot of cattle when they went into mitzrim kabod heavy whenever you see kabod this is the word that is always translated as glory we see the glory, you see the, in the English translations, the glory of the Lord. No, it's kabod Yahweh. Kabod means weight. It's heaviness. It's like what uh, Habakkuk felt when the presence of Yahweh entered the room he was in. He felt heavy. Kabod, it was heavy. It says, machne kabod mad. And mod is simply a way of, oh, it's an adjective, an extreme amount. 
So there were many others besides them. Now, I did the numbers in the patriarchs, their livestock, and the land as far as how many people that were just genetic uh, offspring of Jacob, Yisrael. Uh, and it put us within a couple million. Now, you remember, Abram had this very large company with him when he came to Canaan. Um, did some stay back in Canaan during that last famine that brought Jokup and all his sons down to Gashan? Maybe. But I think a lot of these people that were with them came with them to, into Mitzrim. Maybe a number of them uh, blended in, stayed in Mitzrim, but a number of them came out with them. They had tons of cattle. So you've got to figure you can do like some quick easy calculations and figure what should their footprint be okay so keeping um ah, keeping that in mind i opened up the uh the old mitzram and canon growth charts that i needed to make for the patriarchs their livestock and the land and between how many total people we would have just of jacob's immediate blood family coming out of Mitzrim at this time. And given each one of them for personal body space, 32 square feet is nothing to ask for for personal body space. You can, you can jam cattle together if you have to while you're moving them. As you graze them, no, they really need to spread out or else they're going to be eating each other's feces. You can't have that. But with people, we'll say about 32 square feet. So you figure that is about the size of a sheet of plywood that each person would get just basically as, you know, personal body space. Now, with this figure here, you remember from the Patriarchs, the Livestock, and the Land, I kept this figure down so, so low. I was given, I was given the Middle East and Palestine and Egypt, the surrounding areas. I was given them every possible advantage, and they failed. But, you know, right here I've got this figure of a couple million. And remember, we just read in Exodus 12 that a big mixed multitude with a lot, a whole lot of, it's Kabod Mad, the uh, Boker Makne, so um, cattle Makne, specifying the kind of living possessions, a lot. Now, if it says Kabod Mad, that means a lot. Now, remember, in the Canone growth chart, and these numbers are really small, but way down there we see that just in their time at the end of Canone, and we don't know how many of the people that were with them, um, you could call them servants if you want, I mean they basically, there were so many of them, you know, essentially they had jobs, they were well taken care of. This was a large group of people, it's a very large group of people, even from the start. And at the end there, we figured by their numbers and their growth rate, how many square, uh, square miles of grazing land we would need <laughs> by the month. And it was right around 900 square miles. Now, if you want to go with just number of cattle, we do have, let's see, required livestock in pounds. Now I have on here about 290 million. So let's see, 290 million. Oh, we're just going to round it off to that. So do that. And we'll really pack these cattle together. We won't even give them 32, we won't even give them 32 square feet. You know, we'll give them, we'll give them less. We'll give them, we'll give them half that, which is pathetic. It really is. Um, Got to give them more than half. We'll say times 16. Okay. 4 billion, 640 million. Okay. 4 billion... 640 million. Make sure I get that in correctly. Okay. <clears throat> 
Oh, try this again. Just worked for me. Come on, swap. Oh, they're looking for donations for crying out loud. Hang on. Okay, this one. So, if we pack all of them together, <laughs> if we pack, if we pack them all together, we give them all 16 square feet. They're still going to need 166 square miles. And then the people, you know what? We can round them off at 2 million, right? 2 million? And let's give them 32 square feet. I'm not giving them any less than that because that's just ridiculous to begin with, okay? So 64 million. They need 2.3 square miles. That's just the descendants, direct descendants of Jacob, even without <sighs> counting Levi. Um, that's just, that's a lot, right? So we already have over 100 square miles for the cattle. <laughs> um, all right. They, and they have a ton of cattle, and they got a lot of people with them. So what are we supposed to do with that? Are we supposed to be so friendly? Are we supposed to be so friendly and, and bow to all of these ideas of a Middle East landscape? You know, so much that we just have to check our brains at the door. I mean, you know, I can do some compromises here. And I'm going to bring up Google Earth this time instead of uh, Bing Maps. Because <clears throat> it's really easy for me to uh, to draw these square mile parameters on Google Earth. So, oh, dude, it's a funny. That's funny. They make it look like a sphere. Okay, so let's get to the Middle East. And it's really interesting, too, because a long time ago, before I knew anything about the sheer numbers, you know, and certain interesting specifics about the landscape and all, I really bought a lot of this nonsense um, about the people's movements and stuff. Real silly. I'm going to pick a circle so that I can pretty much control it. And I said, just with the cattle in sort of numbers that we looked at in time and canon, they did great, by the way, in Gashan. Nobody ever said that their cattle was taken away from them. They were just put to hard labor for a long time. Um, yeah, oh yeah, and Peroa was basically committing genocide on the, the children, the male children of Yisrael too. But we still have a number coming out. We still have a huge mixed multitude of people coming out with them. And then we have all of these cattle. All right? Kabod, Mod. A lot of cattle. So when I gave them 16 square foot per cattle, and I only used the amount of cattle that we probably would have had at the end of the time in Canon, I got 166 square miles that we would need for that many square feet per cattle. And we have a few square miles just for the descendants of Jacob Israel minus Louis or Levi, not considering the mixed multitude, which would need space themselves. So you got to give them, put all the people together, and you got to be fair and give them four or five square miles, just them. Now the cattle, they're going to, going to have a lot of cattle. Now, we can knock that down a lot if you want. And the thing is, we know that there was some kind of bird that was brought into the camp, right? So there's that. And we'll, we'll go by that situation later. There was uh, manna that fell that was used as bread and everything. Um, but does that mean they weren't eating meat? Um, I'm going to say I don't think that's the case, but nothing but meat and milk all the time um, with no bread. I mean, even Abram 
Yitzhak and Yokup and all the people that were with them, their companies, which I figured them for good hearty meat eaters. However, I did figure a certain amount of meat that they would have to sell to buy things like bread, spices, maybe fruits and such. Because you can't have your diet absolutely, utterly meat and nothing else. So let me see if I can get... Let's be really conservative. Because I've, I've been doing that from the start, you know? I'll give the Middle East the advantage again. Sure, why not? I'm a nice guy. Sometimes. Um... So let's figure on at least five square miles just for the people's presence. The cattle, come on, man. Five square miles, I mean, that's, that's saying they left basically as paupers concerning the cattle, you know? Um, now here's where it would be if, if I actually <clears throat> calculated the number of square miles needed for cattle based on the numbers at the end of the time in Canone and the the size that that the people would need so that circle i just drew under the word south sinai okay that would be their their basic what do i got area in square miles that would be their basic footprint right there and see the the thing is that circle that i just drew that's fair that's totally fair let me see if i can zoom in here a little bit So there's this story based on the musings of folks like Ron Wyatt and his successors. That there's this place right here on the map, it's 360, saying that Yisrael came out here. And he's calling, and a lot of people want to say this is true, that, that it's actually the Gulf of Aqaba when it says yum soup or is translated red sea because i mean they can't get anything straight here that they they suspect they came out on this platform here right well first off we know that we can't get anywhere near that 170 180 square miles can we because what they'll say is that paroa and his army came up this trail here and that's why they were trapped here, because they couldn't go one way or another. Okay. I'll clear that circle. Now, given this, this land every advantage possible, and, and what? We're going to say that they left as paupers, which they didn't. They had lots of cattle and lots of mixed multitude. That's still people and cattle together requiring 10 square miles. So do you see this circle? This circle on that platform where guys like Ron Wyatt and his successors say that they would have came out and crossed and crossed on a bed of coral? Are you insane? The way wagons would have got stuck, ankles broken? You know, and if I give it a 10 square mile footprint, I'm telling you, man, I am still being way, 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 way more kind than I should be. I'm not being kind even. I'm being illogical and unreasonable given the amount of people and the cattle they would have had. It's, it's actually, it's far more reasonable to figure them for a footprint. You, now remember when, now this is going to be towards the end of the Exodus, that when the king Belak takes this uh, seer, Bellum, on top of this great high place, and they overlook this area that Yisrael's staying in, they said they, they just covered the whole land as far as they can see. Now, if you figure for low mountains or middle-sized mountains, they will figure like for let's say like a lot of mountains in California California has a lot of sort of mid-height mountains they have some low ones some kind of high ones um, and I've been up on a couple of mountains in Northern California 
the distance you can see is insane. It's amazing. In some cases, uh, depending on the rest of the land before you, maybe hundreds of miles. And he's seeing them and he's saying they're covering the land between them and their cattle. There's honestly nothing wrong with this 100 square mile circle I just made right there. Nothing wrong with it at all. If you think there is, you need to go back and watch my video, The Patriarchs, Their Livestock and the Land, to get an idea for why that's not even remotely out of line. So we've got to deal with a really large swath of land that they're covering. And I'm going to close Google Earth now because I can't keep that open. If I keep that open long enough, for some reason it, it acts like that 3D paint and it just wants to stay open no matter what I want to do. So we have them being a very large company. They've got to come out of Mitzram. They've got to either cross the Shahur or go around it. And we don't know which it is. I would think if they had to cross the Shahur and that was kind of an ordeal, we would hear about it. We hear about pretty much all the details of what they had to do, where they are going. But one thing we know that they do they start in Romsus and they go to Sukkoth. And we need to understand a few things about Sukkoth. Sorry, not Shechem, Sukkoth. We're going to Sukkoth. Shechem's different. <laughs> Shechem is an area that we'll, we'll probably talk about, maybe a little bit, um, which I have touched on in other videos. That's where we're going to see Jerusalem or Jerusalem. That's where we're going to see an inheritance left to the sons of Yusuf or Joseph. That's where we're going to see things like um, uh, Mount Mura, Muria. Uh, where Shalmei ends up uh, eventually building the temple. We're going to see a difference between Muria and Siyun. We're going to see a very different landscape than anything that could come close to matching it in what they, um, well, in modern day Palestine. Something I'm going to bring to your attention to remember, it's Mitzrim would be by orientation south of Canon. Um, it would seem that way, but it's never said whether it's uh, east or west. And with what they tell us is the orientation of things today over there in the Middle East, they say that Mitzram is Egypt. They say Canon is Palestine. Well, in Genesis 50, <clears throat> Jacob, Jacob had just died. And his son, Yusuf, which is the second most powerful man in Mitzrim, he asks leave of Perot if, if he can go and um, bury his father. Now, it's really interesting how this all works. I'm going to read you a little bit of it. He ultimately ends up being buried in the uh, in the cavern of this um, the Shade, which I don't think is wild country at all. They sometimes call it field, um, tame area uh, of Machpelah, which Abram he bought uh, for a possession of a burying place um, from Oprin the Hathi before Mamre. And we know from Genesis 23 um, that he bought that, and the place was near um, what became known as Habarun, <clears throat> right? It's right. You can check. So, it says here, it's starting in 5010, <clears throat> they came to 
the threshing floor of a Todd. <laughs> they try to make this a Todd into a person, but if you check a Todd, it's um, it's used in context as like a, a bush or a bramble. It's probably some kind of plant. If threshing floor is threshing floor, and if you check that in context, it looks like it's probably threshing floor. The, uh, the word for the threshing floor here is garan um, of a Todd, uh, which is beyond Yarden. Now what's interesting is the you would have this in the b ober e Yarden. Now it's almost always like that so you have to find out what we're talking about. Where the author is at because the Yarden is a bifurcation. Uh, you remember I said in the last video that um, rivers and bodies of water are used as boundaries and they bifurcate. Yardan definitely does. And no matter which side we're talking about, you're almost always going to see it expressed as Baober e Yardan. So this threshing floor of Atad is described as over Yardan, which is beyond Yardan. And there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, <coughs> the Canonim, the Canonim, Canaanites, when the inhabitants of the land, Canaanites, the Canaanites only dwelt on the one side of Yardan. The other side of Yardan was inhabited by other peoples. They're only said to be dwelling on the one side of Yardan. When they saw them, they saw the morning, they said, This is a grievous morning for the midstream, wherefore the name of it was called Abel Midstream. Abel oftentimes is very appropriately translated as meadow, which again they'll say be ober at Yardan, which is beyond the Yardan. And the sons did unto him according as he commanded them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cavern of the field of Machpelah. Now first off, the fact that the Canonim are noticing the morning tells me that they're not on the other side, the east side of what we think of today as the Jordan. Everybody can, can, can imagine this in their mind. Think of Palestine and think of what the Jordan is supposed to be. It's supposed to go from that Sea of Galilee straight down north to south, straight south to the Dead Sea, right? And they're going to tell us that's the Jordan. And then they're going to tell us that Mitzrim is Egypt and that is far west of Palestine. And they're saying that's Canaan or Canaan. And so they're saying that he would have had to have carried him up and over, and I'm going to show you this real fast. So do they want us to believe that they started out somewhere in this area, and they go straight through, remember, the place that they just named, they called it Abel Mizrim, <clears throat> they said Beober a Yarden. So when you think about it, what would have to, that would have to mean is that on the other side of Jordan from Egypt. So they're trying to say that what they would have taken him to the other side of Jordan. Well, the first problem with that is the Canaanites or Canonim were said to dwell on only the one side of Jordan. But this idea that they would have to go cross over Yardan, and we're always given the idea that there was no bridge, right? Well, what happened was when they entered Canon, Yahweh actually parted the Yardan as well. Was there no major bridge? Well, I think there were bridges kind of all around, but I do think the contingent of Yisrael was so huge that to get them across Yardan when they came into the land with <coughs> you show Joshua, that's why the parting. In in one way, and also because it was another generation. And Yahweh wanted to, I think, encourage them with that parting of the Yardan, which which, which was, in my opinion, was a very big river. 
So we would get this idea that they would have to go all the way to the far side of Yardan to this place called the Threshing Floor of Atad, which we know nothing about, right? Well, Abel Mitzrim only has actually one uh, entry. A threshing Floor has a lot, and Threshing Floor seems like it might be relatively close to the point. A Todd, however, you see how they make it into a person in Genesis 50, verses 10 and 11. They make it into a proper noun person. But in Judges 9.14, Judges 9.15, and Psalm 58.9, it's not a person, it's a thing. It's a bush, it's a bramble. And we don't have <clears throat> we don't have any knowledge of this uh Gorin Atad before this. They went and made a great mourning for him. And then they buried him in this cavern of Machpelah, which we know is by what we understand to be Habarun or Hebron. So, are we to, to believe or think that they would have went all the way on the other side of this Jordan? Either by skirting the Dead Sea. This, this whole area is crap. It's an unforgiving place. Uh, so by either skirting it south and heading straight up north to this place, or, you know, maybe a bridge somewhere around here, right? The procession they would have taken would have been very big. Um, because I don't think they wanted to get uh, robbed or killed on the way. Um, and they would have crossed over the Jordan for some reason. They don't tell us. And then, after their mourning was done for seven days, now they're done mourning, so they're going to pack everything uh, back up and head all the way, way back over. And this whole, by the way, this whole landscape south of what they call Jerusalem today in Palestine, it's rough, man. This is rough, jagged landscape. They'd have to skirt north pretty good and then come down to Hebron. They're telling us that's what they did. Well, I don't know if that's the case or if it's just more likely that what we're looking at, and wouldn't you know it, every time I put it on pen, it wants to give me a pen size that's a lot bigger than I want. Now, that's at five point, but that's still too big. How about one point? I'm not 15. One. Not 115. I'm sorry. Um, come on, delete, 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 delete. Okay, now one. Oops, one. <laughs> Enter. Oh, that's a little bit better. Okay. So, we've got this Yardan. This is a river, and it is a bifurcation. And you know it's a bifurcation because always we're going to see this again when they get to Kadesh or Kadesh Barano. That even at the first chapter of Devarim or De De Deuteronomy, it says in Ober E Yardin. The Yardin is used as a bifurcation, period. So the idea that they would leave. Egypt, if it was in Egypt, and go up to Palestine, if it was Palestine, cross over the Jordan, do their mourning in some place over here, and then have to cross back over and travel, you know, it'd have to be almost due west and then cut hard south just to get to um, the cave of Machpelah by Hebron to bury him is kind of insane. You could mourn right near the place where you were going to bury him and then bury him. Doesn't that make the most sense? And it says that it is on the other side <clears throat> of the Yardan. So if we have the Yardan flowing in some sort of like north to southward, okay, um, then what I'm expecting is that, now let me just put a line here. What I'm expecting is that <clears throat> the area of Mitzrim that they they left from and came to 
has to be specifically across from where they buried him. And I know that might seem a bit confusing, okay? Because we know they buried him in Habarun. And we know the place that they called um, Abo Mitzrim, this threshing floor of Atad. It's said to be in Ober a Yarden. Habarun and everything, because of the bifurcation of Yarden, it's going to be on one side of it. And I'm going to say by everything that we can find description-wise, that it is westward to Yarden, unless I'm wrong about Mabua and Mezara. Which means that the area of Mitzrim that they would have left would have probably been eastward from Yarden. They don't cross Yarden at all until they're ready to go into Canaan at the very end of these 40 years. We're going to see more of an absurdity with the fact that they left Romsis and went to Sakoth. Sakoth is supposed to be, they say, up here in the territory of Gad, which is actually would have to be on the uh, east side of modern-day Jordan, somewhere between the Dead Sea and up the Sea of Galilee, all the way up here. And then they end up back at Edom, or Etham, and they have to cross the Red Sea. So you're telling me all the way down here, according to Ron Wyatt and his type? Or some would say over here. And I'm here to tell you that they would have had to have gone all the way back to Suez, at least, to pull this one off. <clears throat> From all the way up in Sukkoth, up here. Or does it make more sense that Yardan being quite a bifurcation of this place that we're talking about, that... Sakoth would have been on one side, we'll say the east side for now, and maybe quite a bit far south, because we have to get a really good idea of where certain landmarks are. And we know that where they wept for Jacob was on the other side of Yardan from where they started. And I'm telling you, that it is most likely that Habrun is off to the west of Yarden. And that being the case, then where they started from Mitzrim would have had to have been to the east of Yarden. Now, a lot of this stuff I might erase, and, you know, we're going to have to develop this map as we go. But we'll see, because we're going to pick right, right up with Romsis to Sukkoth. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. You'll see how absurd it is. Um, but we do have a number of entries on Sukkoth, and we can get really good ideas about Sukkoth, and we can really pinpoint it. And then you can tell me if it makes any sense that they would journey all that distance to then journey back all that distance so that they could cross one of these gulfs of the Red Sea. Till next time, take care.